Welcome to the Speaking Podcast. You can find all our episodes on speakingpodcast.com. We're also on BitChute and YouTube as Speaking Podcast. I also have the Awakening Podcast, Meditation Podcast, Iron Polish Podcast, and the Crypto Podcast. And all can be found on RoyCon.com. Today, my guest, I should say, from Florida originally, currently in Texas, two very good places of freedom, I would say. Please welcome Nick Aguera. Aguera? Aguirre. Aguirre. Pretty good. <laughs> Pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. Excellent. So I always like to ask my guests, you might let the audience know who's Nick. Awesome. Yeah. So hi, guys. Nick Aguirre of Apex Mind Coaching. I help leaders and speakers to manage their stress and reclaim their mind so they can perform optimally, so they can shatter their limitations and feel great while they do it. Um, I am, in addition to being a mental performance coach, also a hypnotist. And a lot of my work centers around helping people to build winning identities so they can perform at the highest level. Uh, some places that I apply this is in speaking, in sales, in presentations, anywhere that person needs to step into their, their strongest power and to do so through the subconscious mind. Excellent. So I suppose we'll start off with the hypnosis because, I mean, I've seen, I've seen it on stage I don't know mm. what to be, it's, I've never been hypno, hypnotized. Um, yeah. I know some people, they claim they have been and they said they, don't, they can't remember what's happening. So how, sure. did, how did you go down that route? And, you know, can somebody be persuaded to do something they don't really want to? Yeah. So two questions there. First is, uh, how did I get into it? And the second, can people be uh, persuaded, made to do something they don't want to? So I'll answer the first one. Yeah. So um, I've been speaking for a long time and I started in, uh, university. So I was teaching communications. Uh, I was a lecturer for quite a while and I would travel and I would go to conferences and conventions. And I didn't know too much about hypnosis, but one day I was at a marketing convention and they said, we have a late show tonight. There's going to be a hypnotist. And I thought it's a little bit weird. I, is that real? Is that, I don't know if that's real. I, it was like, whatever, let's go check it out. And so I saw this and, you know, these were not like special people or actors. They're just ordinary, um, you know, people, entrepreneurs, salespeople, uh, and they get called up to the stage. You know, I, I kind of volunteered. I, I wanted to get hypnotized on that day, but I couldn't seem to relax. I was a little bit scared. So the guy asked me to sit down, you know, and I did. But what I saw next really blew my mind. Um, the people being taken into a trance and they're being given suggestions, do this, do that. And, um, you know, when you start to see people just following along, the first thing that came to mind is, well, are they pretending? Maybe they're just, they're kind of just going along with it. Right. But that didn't feel right to me for a few reasons. One was just the, the look on the people and their, their faces, their expression was, it was different. It was not ordinary. And, you know, he would give people suggestions. Uh, everyone gets a number from one to 10, 10 people. And then odd numbers, you're going to watch. You are now watching the funniest movie ever. Even numbers, you're watching the saddest movie ever. And you're seeing people laughing hysterically and crying. And I think it's pretty hard to create that emotion on command just to, to just make yourself doing that. So I think I don't think these people are acting. But I'm still kind of skeptical. But later on in the show, this is what really sealed the deal for me, because the whole time I'm thinking, well, you know what, maybe it's just an illusion. It's it's smoke and mirrors. It's it's some kind of social trick or or some kind of mentalist thing. Right. But there's a man and there's a woman and the man is hypnotized. He's on the stage. Right. He's he's very deep into the relaxation. He's he's with what's going on. And there's a there's a woman in the audience. So the hypnotist um, asks the woman is this your husband? And she says, no, it's, oh, it's my boyfriend. And he says, okay, uh, how long have you guys been together? She says, oh, four years now. And he says, okay, how come he hasn't asked you the big question yet? How come he you know, hasn't proposed? And she says, I don't know. It's just the, the money is not yet. We, we just don't know. It's not the right time. And he goes, okay, do you want me to fix this for you? I'll fix it right now. And she says, oh my God, yes. Oh my God. And so I'm thinking, I'm like, there's no way this can't be real. Like, this is not going to happen. And she goes over to the man, he, the, the boyfriend who's hypnotized. And he says something to him. 
you know, and then the man all of a sudden he stands up and he addresses the room. And I knew him earlier that weekend. He seemed very shy, very introverted, but he just speaks openly to the entire room and addresses everyone and announces his love. And he, he asked the woman to marry her. And I've never seen anyone so happy in my life. And the whole time is just my jaw is on the floor. I'm in disbelief. I can't, I, I'm shocked by what I'm seeing here. So the whole, that whole situation, I couldn't sleep at night. <laughs> and um, I, I tried to go back to work and think about, you know, my job and teaching at the university. I just got obsessed with hypnosis. And it led me to you know, your next question, which is like, well, what's the extent of this? Would that man have really married that woman anyways? Is this all just an act? Is this real? Maybe, so maybe, down, he, maybe he didn't marry her. He might have sued the guy for <laughs> making him do that. I, I think they're still married. I'm, I'm not sure. I'll have to, I'll have to look it up. So I, I believe that um, people cannot be really made to do things that they don't want to do on some level. But the more that you entrain somebody to answer your question, the longer that you have with a person to get them into it, and the more that you expose them to your ideas, and the further they get into the trance, the more likely it is. So I think it depends. And there's been times of um, you know certain crimes or murders that have been committed, and people will say, "Well, is this real?" Because you know they were. Um, they were uh, under the, the control of this person who was changing their beliefs, their behaviors, their environment. So they, were they really doing that? Would they have done that anyways? So it, it, where does your free will end and someone else's begin? It's a challenging question, but I don't think that the average person needs to worry about um, you know being controlled. So it, it's not like uh, I can go walk up to somebody and just say, you know, give me, give me your car, give me your wallet. Your, it's hard. It's very unlikely for that to happen. I don't think most people need to worry about that kind of thing. And because with the kind of, you know, what you mentioned, somebody do something bad, kill somebody and they say kind of like the MK ultra thing, you know, yeah, like exactly. we, we yeah. see, we see now like the media, you know, people are kind of, that's kind of more of a propaganda, but I, I don't know, you know, what they're doing. But if you look at, say, like religions or cults, you know, mm -hmm. they're basically getting convincing people. Is that a form of hypnosis? Yes. So, yeah, totally. So with the way you can define hypnosis a bunch of different ways, but for the purpose of this podcast, I'm talking about having a undue influence on somebody's behavior or beliefs. So yeah, religions, cults, anything like that is a great example. Um, before we learn hypnosis, as a hypnotist or hypnotherapist, you usually learn about hypnotic modalities, which means how do people make decisions and arrive at conclusions? Because once you understand that, then you can understand how to influence them. So um, there's three main ingredients that you need for hypnotic modality. You'll see this in uh, you know, religions, cults, certain environments. It's not good or bad, ethical or unethical. It depends how you use it. Um, we, we as human beings, we have a strong need to believe in something and have something meaningful to follow where we can get um, answers and direction because we're not meant to be alone. We need things from our environment, from our... Um, from family, friends, other people to have some direction. So that, that leaves us prone to being suggestible. And in the wrong environment, um, you could be suggested into doing things you wouldn't normally do. So back to those three ingredients for hypnotic modality. So the first one that you need is authority. The second one is uh, doctrine or belief system. And then the third is some kind of emotional overload. So authority, doctrine, and emotional overload. And I'll explain what those three are. So the first is authority. So you will see people with, uh, for example, a doctor has a white coat and a stethoscope that suggests authority, that you're going to listen to them. If you see a commercial with a man in a white coat and saying, my name is doctor, whatever, and I endorse this product, that's authority. There you see people with special uniforms, um, special ranks, special clothes, that's authority. When you walk into um, a church, for example, there'll be an elevated stage and maybe a podium with the lights on this person. They have a special title. That's 
authority. You go on a website and it says some of our clients include Disney, CNN, ABC, that's authority. Or they say, you know, Tony Robbins likes my book, authority, right? So, so these are all indicators that will bypass people's reasoning to an extent that you don't, maybe you don't trust a claim on a website until you see, um, well, Dr. Phil said it's okay, so then it's okay, or, or whatever. So that's authority. The second element is the doctrine. So this is either a belief system. It could be a text in the case of religion, uh, a, you know, 12 rules or 10 steps to that, some kind of, of thing to feed people's belief system through. So it says, uh, oh, I'm supposed to do this every day. I'm not supposed to do that, right? I'm not supposed to do this, do that. Um, and this can be used to guide people so used ethically, it, it's principles to help us live a better life or have successful behavior, but used unethically, it can be used to make people stop reasoning and stop thinking for themselves um, and say, well, you know, this book says that we have to uh, hurt people who believe differently than us or something like that. So that's the second element. The third one is the emotional overload. So um, the very primitive parts of us in our in our limbic system is where uh, we don't really do as much of that, that high level logical thinking, it's it's more um, primitive, we respond to emotions. And um, it, it has the tendency for us to do what we feel is good based on emotions. And then later, we'll logically justify it. So emotional overload, if you talk about a, something like a church, there will be uh, figures and images of this powerful icons. There will be beautiful stained glass candles that are kind of, you know, hypnotic that pull your attention there. Sound, light, a lot of sensory things that engage people on that, that physical level. So they're not reasoning as much. Um, and having a chanting, worship, you will see this uh, in in America, where we have um, some of the Greek life fraternities and sororities, there's a lot of singing and, and chanting things. Um, and then you stop kind of thinking and you just start chanting along. And then sometimes people don't even realize what they're saying or, or chanting because it's happening on another level. So those are the three ingredients that can be used to influence people on a very widespread level. I read a book recently, I'm trying to think of the name, and it was on cults, the guy was actually in a cult, and then it's helping people, and, you know, he was basically saying that they kind of catch a lot of people, you know, if they've gone through a divorce or a trauma, somebody's died, belonged to them, they know they're at a weak point in their life, and then they go from, but there was another thing that was kind of fascinating, because there was an organization that was to help people that were in cults, and it went into bankruptcy, and the Scientology bought it for something like 10,000 so I can imagine someone is actually ringing up to get help and it, it, they're dealing with a Scientologist you know wow yeah exactly wow that's that's very interesting <laughs> if you yeah if you do remember the book please uh, send it to me on LinkedIn yeah. I, I would love to see that yeah I will of course mm. and with a NLP then right? like what's the kind of correlation with that so, so NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, um, are you asking what's the correlation between cults and NLP? No, no, or? sorry, with, with hypnosis and, our, you know. Sure. Yeah. So sometimes I think there, there are different tools. Um, the, so N NLP is, some people say, the study of successful behavior. And some of the things that you'll use it for it's a language-based intervention. Uh, fears and phobias is very common. You could use this to address, um, you know, fear of public speaking, uh, fear of dogs, spiders, snakes, whatever. Um, people who have basically images or ideas in their mind that are pervasive because they, they have this neural pathway of a, a thought or a memory keeps coming to them. It's unpleasant. And you can switch that by training people to have a new thought, a new image, a new idea. Um, so uh, hypnosis and NLP, and NLP, they can be used for a lot of the same things, but then there's times when one uh, is more appropriate than the other. 
So if you wanted to create um, anesthesia or do pain management or something like that, you'd probably use hypnosis, which is going to take longer, but you get them into a very deep trance state. With NLP, if you need something very quickly where you can create some of these outcomes in five or 10 minutes, um, that's where you might use NLP. So um, the idea of NLP is the map is not the territory. And what that means is if somebody is, let's say, scared of public speaking, they're not actually scared of public speaking. They're scared of the sensations or feelings that they have based on an image of it. So maybe if someone was a young kid and they had to present and they got made fun of, or they got criticized, um, or they got laughed at. So now they have this image that's stuck in their neurology so that it's associated very strongly with the act of speaking. If you help the person to change that image, to replace that image, and to train their mind like a muscle to keep doing that, they'll form a more successful image, and then they'll now associate public speaking or whatever it is we're talking about with something that's more pleasant and the, the behavior will start to get more successful when you do that. I've actually, it happened me because I was very late to the game, getting comfortable speaking on stage and it was from school. And what I've noticed is, I mean, I've mm -hmm. done on the speaking podcast nearly, there's a lot in the, that haven't been released, but I've about 150 or something like that. And there was a huge percentage that had some trauma from school mm -hmm. that actually affected them. It, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, like we're talking, and this seems to be, even when you talk to people that aren't on the podcast, most people have been abused in some form by a teacher, you know, verbally or whatever, just this, you know, it's, it's not the other students, it's normally the teacher that's doing this to them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's very common and we've, we've all had an experience where we said something, whether it was to an individual or to a group, and it was not received well. And we got criticized and we got uh, met with disapproval or criticism. And because we're these tribal beings, we need each other to survive. And we're kind of designed to be in these small groups of you know, 100, 150 people. On that level, it's like if I was an ancestral human being and I was met with disapproval and I was exiled from the tribe, that could be dangerous, potentially even fatal. Yeah, being exiled or banished from a, a tribe as as an ancestral human is you're very likely to die. So we have these things that are way blown out of proportion because we're not designed for the way things are today. So fears, phobias, traumas resulting from so something that happened early on. Yeah, it's remarkably common. It's remarkably common. Um, and it, it can be overcome. It, it can certainly be overcome. And sometimes you can even use that to propel you forward that to know that if you can do it, even when you're scared, or if you can do it, even though something bad happened to you, then you have a lot of will and a lot of determination moving forward. And for somebody that's basically terrified of public speaking, and I suppose now with the craziness going on in the world, and you can't even go into some stages or whatever, just even a lot of people, uh, they're not even comfortable doing kind of a zoom call or you know being on live what what, what kind of tips would you give them or what advice would you give them to try to overcome it sure so the first place would just be to have a strong awareness of <clears throat> what it is exactly that you're averse to because sometimes it's not what people think it is so sometimes people will um be say they're have a fear of public speaking and then you could ask them questions. Well, if it was just, if it was strangers, is that different than if it's with people, you know, if it was one person, would that scare you? If it was five, if, if it was 10, if it was a hundred, if it was online versus in person, does that matter? So if you examine some of these variables, then you start to get closer to what is it actually that this person is averse to? Because sometimes it's um, a very specific image that they have in their in their head and you can overcome um, whatever that specific thing is that they don't like. So you have to, at some point, confront it. And the one of the best ways to do this, to prepare yourself is through mental rehearsal. 
So we know now that when you vividly imagine something, your mind doesn't really know the difference between what you vividly imagine and what's actually happened. So a study was done with people who were practicing uh, basketball shots, and they would have three groups of people. One group does not practice the, the basketball shot. The second group, they will physically practice every day. And then the third group only visualizes, only imagines doing the shot, but physically doesn't do anything. So the results are those who didn't practice, they got worse or stayed the same. Those who actually practiced physically, of course, they got better. But interestingly enough is those who only visualized improved pretty much the same as those who physically practiced. So you're creating expectation when you do this. So imagine the outcome. This is one of the big principles of success in NLP. Know your outcome. So say the outcome is I want to successfully speak in front of a thousand people from start to finish and have it be a speech that I enjoy giving. Well, I need to visualize that. I need to imagine that. If you do that for five minutes a day, every day for a month or two, you're going to find that you have a much better shot of success um, because now you are training yourself to expect that outcome when you visualize it. I'm noting because most people have a negative thoughts. They start thinking negative. So they're actually dooming themselves when they go, you know, because they're going, what if I do this? What if I slip? For example, plenty of people say, oh, I hope I don't spill this cup of tea when I'm in this meeting. And what do they do? They spill the cup of tea because they've been constantly yeah. thinking of that. That's exactly right. You're right, Roy. So it, I'm so glad you mentioned that. Um, there's like a law of attraction people will talk about when you focus on something a lot, you get it. But the law of attraction works in reverse, where you can attract something negative, you can manifest a negative outcome. So example would be uh, if people say like, oh, you know, my throat feels weird. Am I getting sick? I hope I'm not getting sick. Oh, I don't want to get a cold. I can't get a cold. I don't want to get sick this weekend. Oh, I have to go on this podcast. I don't want to get sick. And they're focusing on it so much that it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, taking up more space. And the harder you try not to think about it, the more you think about it. So um, you, you can focus on the thing that you do want. The analogy that I'll give people, that I give clients, I see this all the time with, with certain fears. Uh, it's like the, the race car driver analogy. So if, I, if I'm a race car driver, to Formula One, NASCAR, whatever, I say to myself, I'm not going to crash into the wall. Don't crash into the wall. Don't crash into the wall. So what happens? I think of the wall and then I look at the wall and the car goes where my eyes go and I crash into the wall. So not even thinking about that. So having an image of what you don't want is powerful because you can replace it with the image of what you do want. And that's a lot of what you'll do with, uh, with NLP and hypnosis. Design your desired outcome, create a vivid and compelling image see it, hear it, feel it, taste it, smell it, everything. Very vivid, very real, like it's already happened. And then you'll start to see the success. The other thing is, uh, well, what happens if you uh, do make mistakes? What happens if you do fail? Um, I think that's worth talking a little bit about. What do you think? Mistakes? Absolutely. Okay. So many people have that. What if I make a mistake? Or what if I screw up or I say the wrong thing or I forget? Well, I want to share a story. Actually, I'd like to share a, a very embarrassing story about uh, and it's one of my favorite stories. So this was Halloween of last year and I did a, a hypnosis show. So normally what you will do is you'll get a bunch of chairs. You put them up on a stage and you're going to hypnotize the entire audience to find out who's responding the best and bring them up. But because there weren't enough people, we just could only um, get volunteers and we would get, uh, you know, maybe six volunteers up there. And we have no idea if they're going to be good subjects because everybody could be hypnotized, but some people respond better than others. Some people can concentrate and go in very quickly. And those are the ones that you generally want for a stage show. But we didn't and, have time. And just for people that don't know, because I have seen that where they normally they get them to 
crossed their hands and they say you can't open it so therefore the people that can't open their hands they would normally bring them up the stage because they're kind of prone to suggestion yeah exactly so you'll do usually something that's um physical common ones are yeah having people's fingers move um, having people's arms lower or raised so you'll give somebody the suggestion your hands getting lighter you're holding these balloons it's lifting rising rising lifting higher and higher light as a feather all the way up in the air and you'll see some people move a little bit some don't move at all some people their arm is straight up and those are the ones that they're essentially volunteering so you'll you'll grab those people we didn't have time to do any of that we just um got a handful of people um my microphone was not working correctly so i had this stupid mask on because of of covid <laughs> uh and so i have i'm talking to the microphone and going oh, blah, 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 and they can't hear <laughs> so i'm having to kind of mess around with it take off the mask um and I'm trying to put down like put the microphone away and it just goes Ey! and it's it's like <laughs> everything went wrong so i kind of made myself not not look very professional um and when i was like okay i'm not going to use the microphone and then um somebody's telling me like uh you know nick we can't see you when you're standing there because the light is like too bright in there can you move over there? so everything you know i talked about how you need authority to make people suggestible all of the things that would normally give me authority, like this, this stage, the lights, the microphone is gone, right? So now I just am some guy. So that's, so that's gone. Um, having the people selected that would be best, don't have that. Um, so I'm just kind of like, whatever. I made up my mind to do this. And the worst fear that you have is like, well, what if it doesn't work? What if you know people don't get hypnotized or they don't respond to the suggestion? So I'm taking people through and it's going better than I, than I think. And the audience appears very engaged and I'm giving some suggestions. You know, you cannot open your, your eyes. They're stuck. The harder you try to open them, the more stuck they become and they're responding. So that's really, really good. So it's going well. Um, and at some point there's a person who is not responding. And usually I just ask them to sit down and say, well, thanks for trying. Uh, the person refuses there. They said, no. And I said, you want to stay up here? Well, okay, fine. Um, and I was, I was like, whatever. And I kept going because I didn't want to argue with this person. And then uh, they're actively resisting me. And so the second time around, I'm saying, um, okay, you know, you don't appear to be responding while you have a seat. This lady stands up and goes, you're full of bullshit. And then she goes, <laughs> And then um, goes and sits down. And I did the same thing that I always do. I just I just said, let's give this person a round of applause. And so, you know, um, I don't care. So I keep going um, because I have made up my mind that I'm just going to do it regardless of what happens. Um, so then I get to the next level um, and I'm going to give people the suggestion that they forget their name. So how is this you know, possible? It's if you have the right person in the right circumstance, absolutely possible. The same way people forget their watch, their wallet, their keys, their, their hat, their glasses right in their hand. They forget it. They forget a common word. So you can evoke that same feeling. And that's what I'm attempting to do is give people a suggestion. You forget your name. It's completely gone. The harder you try to recall your name, the further away it gets. Upon awakening, find that you cannot remember your name. And I it did everything perfectly, but then I... I awaken everyone. I go to the first person. I say, what's your name? And they say, Bob. And I'm like, fuck. Okay. You go to the next person. What's your, <laughs> what's your name? Steve. Fuck. What's your name? Karen. What's your name? I go all the way down like six people. And the very last person is someone that I knew. And I just look at them like, like, please. Oh my God. I'm just giving them a look like, like, <laughs> and, and said, what's your name? And then they said their name. And I'm and so I paused for a second. I turned to the audience and I said, that's our show. And everyone, <laughs> everyone starts laughing, uh, everyone and applauding. Everyone laughs and applauds. So um, it was uh, it was some of the most fun that I've had in my entire life. It was a very funny story that I tell people and that I tell new hypnotists if they're scared. What if it doesn't you know, what if this happens? Everything that you're scared that's going to happen is going to happen at some point. It's the, and that's the best part. Um, so I have a funny story and now I don't care. So if that, the fear is so massive of that event, 
But then once it happens, you find out I'm still here. Nobody cares. It's funny. I have it's I have it all all on video. It's really funny. <laughs> um, and uh, people came up to me after the show and said that was you know incredible. Uh, do do you have a business card? Can you talk about this? Can you come speak at this event? So just knowing that even though everything can go wrong, it's still a success. So this is the the thing that I would offer to people on mistakes. Number one is that it makes you human and it makes you relatable because everybody's going to screw up at some point. And people don't want to see a robot. They don't want to hear from a robot. They want to talk to a human person who forgets to take out the recycling, the person who stubs their toe on the coffee table in the middle of the night, the person who forgets um, their friend's birthday. That's a real person just like you and me. So it's going to happen. And then the second thing is um, the fear of something is usually worse than the event itself. And once you confront it, it frees you and it liberates you to do it. That um, I've embarrassed myself. I've said the wrong thing. I've done the wrong thing. And I'm still here. And then now that fear no longer controls me and I can do anything now. And I mean, your reaction as well, because if something isn't going right, you can't try to talk. But I've seen that. I mean, I've seen people, you know, if their laptop doesn't work or whatever, or something like are people just starting again to have it to a speech and they go, oh, oh, I missed up and they just you just you don't connect. Whereas when something goes, doesn't go right and you see a person, he knows it, we know it, but he just goes on. And you can admire the person for that, you know, instead of just throwing in the towel. Mm hmm. Absolutely. The, because sometimes you can't control the event like technology, it's going to go bad at some point. So the way that you react, it matters everything because some people say, oh, my God, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry about this. Oh, yeah, please give me one second. Oh, I'm sorry. And they, they you know, lose their composure versus somebody who says, guys, we're having a technical difficulty. Sorry about this. Um, I'm just going to continue without the PowerPoints and I'll send them to you later. And that that's it makes a world of difference. Absolutely. Yeah, I and <laughs> there's one more story I saw. Uh, I didn't witness this, but I heard about it. It's somebody who is doing speaking coaching and he had an exercise of warming up your jaw and your throat. And um, you would take a, a very big pen, like a large Sharpie, very large Sharpie. You put it between your um, your teeth to open up your, your jaw, basically. So you have the marker there and the man is demonstrating with this, this jumbo Sharpie. And then, you know, he pulls it out of his mouth and he draws a giant line on the side of his face and he has no idea. And he continues with the, the speech and guess what he's selling speaking, coaching, training products. And the result is not what you'd expect. What happened was at the end in this conference, everyone stood up, they turned around and went to the back tables and they bought everything that he had and he sold out everything because he just didn't care and he kept going and made a mistake so confident, very confident. And then later people told him, <laughs> he found out and was he was mortified, but he didn't know then. So yeah, the mistakes are, are good. It's the best part. You know, it, it makes it human, makes it real, makes it relatable um, and, there, there's no way around it, actually. So just go make mistakes. I encourage you. And like, how were you for your next show? Because obviously it's in your head and it's like, oh, twin, mm -hmm. 10 things can go wrong. Was that mm -hmm. taught there or did you go, well, it can't be worse than the last show? Well, the way that you view mistakes and, and you know, so-called failures matters everything because they, to me, it's data points is very valuable. It's great data. Um, you know, so if you make a, 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 say you make a YouTube video and people click off of it in the first four seconds, some people will say, this means that I'm a failure and I'm bad and I should just quit YouTube. Other people will say, I need to make the first four seconds of my YouTube video better so it hooks. So what, do you, what, what did I learn from that um, stage show is um, how to control the lights. Do not use uh, the microphone with the mask. Do this. Um, you know, don't don't start with this suggestion. You there's tons of data. So 
you learn six or seven things. If 10 things went wrong in a show, you just learned 10 things. So as long as you don't repeat the mistake, it's very valuable. And then you can share it with other people. Yeah, that's that's what I would have to say about that. Uh, do you are you kind of doing stuff online now or is it possible to actually i mean the coaching obviously you can but i mean regarding the hypnosis and stuff is that something that can be done online or is you have to be yeah. physically with people you can absolutely do it online so pretty much all of my clients are on zoom now and the the reason it works is because at the end of the day all hypnosis is self-hypnosis. So you're guiding someone into these states of relaxation where they really just need to hear your voice and follow along with the suggestions. So you don't need to, um, you know, touch people or do anything special like that it can all be done online. And because I've heard of people uh, being able to give up smoking through hypnosis. And I'm just curious because say like they like to say cancer because especially in america it's very high percentage of people that can get it we've all got this in our in our systems and a lot of it is down to the kind of mentality is hypnosis something that could be used for that as well to kind of make somebody think more on the positive side to heal themselves so um the first thing i heard was are, are you asking if hypnosis could be used to like give up smoking or bad habits? well, well that... i know i i've heard that it works for smoking i've heard of people and i'm just curious because i mean i've never heard of it but i'm just just a thought that popped in my mm -hmm. head that for say illnesses that mm -hmm. could you kind of get into someone's head to start basically self-healing because i know we are capable of self-healing but sometimes you know people don't have the belief system of that Totally. And it's been very well researched. I think the person who's done this the best that I can think of is Dr. Joe Dispenza. He's got a few books. One of them is Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself. Um, and his idea is based a lot on what he calls meditations, but they're, it's similar to like a self-hypnosis uh, and visualization. And it's absolutely possible. They've done a lot of studies with this one um, that's notorious in the, the hypnotherapy community was on people for irritable bowel syndrome. And what they found was when they have people visualize um, a healthy gut, they're being shown pictures of a healthy uh, stomach, healthy gut while they're hypnotized and made to believe that it's their own. So the more anatomically correct your visualization is, the better. So I'll give you a few examples of, let's say that somebody um, hurts their back. And just to be clear, this is not medical advice, you know, talk to doctor or physician about this. But um, if you're visualizing, say your back is hurt and you visualize, uh, you, you want to first look at the picture of a healthy spine or healthy disc or, or whatever it is that you're fixing and see that visualize it, believe it's your own, spend a few minutes a day visualizing that will create the, the successful outcome. Another way is sometimes um, people will visualize colors and light. So being filled with a white light or something that's healing. So if green is a soothing color, if blue is a healing color, then you visualize blue or green or whatever on the area of your body that's hurt, you will absolutely improve. Yeah, and just just on that because with the back, I I had a trapped nerve when I was in my early twenties, and I I tried everything, and I was like I tried all alternative stuff and everything. So I got an epidural that didn't work. Then I got the operation that didn't work, and I was thrown in the towel to be honest with you. And there was a book, Healing Back Pain, by John Doctor John Sarno, and. Yeah. I mean, I cured myself mentally. I, like, I think I believe from it that it was stress that causes that. I mean, we're, we were lied by the doctors pretending, oh, this is pressure, your disc is this. Like, that's the reality of everyone's this. But when you listen to a doctor, that's showing you that. But I've recommended that book to at least 20 people who had back pain because some people get the trapped nerve in their arm, the others in the leg, and they've all cured. They've all been cured. And I say, how come that's not the port to call? But the reality is it just shows how powerful the thought process is that we can 
and I instead of going under the knife. Totally. Yeah, I know exactly the book that you're talking about. Um, I, I completely forgot, but yeah, it's a it's a book based on visualization, and the. Yeah, there, there's a lot of data to support that this works for physical problems, for uh, mental, emotional problems, for fears, phobias, the visualization. And the way that I like to think of it is um, rather than seeing yourself as like one person, you're an army of a trillion cells and you your mind is the captain of these trillion cells that you tell it every day what's going to happen. Um, are we going to be alert or lazy are we going to be in pain or are we going to feel well are we going to be fearful or courageous and you give that command to the trillion cells in your body or however many and say today we're going to do this and every cell says okay captain and it obeys you and it gets used to it and now you have this this whole army that's working for you yeah um the last thing I'd like want to say on that note is over 90% of our behavior is driven by the subconscious mind. So the more that you're doing this, the more you're telling that 90% what to do because you can't directly control it. So you have to give the command to yourself through visualization, through hypnosis, through NLP. And then over time, it starts to adjust and to do those things automatically. Absolutely. And just finally there with the coaching so you might explain the kind of coaching that you do and you know sure totally so i work with all kinds of people but the main clients that i work with are uh, business owners and leaders entrepreneurs um speakers absolutely sales people anyone who needs to really use a hundred percent of their mind for success and to step into the winning identity so a lot of different offers I have, but the most popular one is called Subconscious Superpower. And it's a five-week program that I offer where I help somebody to connect with and reprogram their subconscious, which drives 90% of their behavior. I'll just talk uh, just briefly on some of the things that we'll cover in that time. Um, so I do identity development in the first week. So creating successful identity. So if you want to be a successful speaker or salesperson or business owner, you first create that vision and that identity as we've been discussing here. Uh, the next module, I do a mental emotional detox where I help people to identify thoughts, feelings, memories, regrets, traumas, anything that's taking up space in their mind and building a strategy to overcome that and put it into the past forever. Then I help people with self-empowerment. So I help them to identify uh, beliefs and behaviors of self-sabotage, then replace them with behaviors and beliefs of self-empowerment. Um, then I work on installing a peak state. So if you ever have a day where everything's going right, it's flowing, it's easy, you're in the zone, that's what we call a peak state. And we actually know that through repetition, you can condition somebody to instantly get into that peak state which I do before getting on this podcast or before I meet with a client or anything like that. You just, it's not, oh, I feel bad today. I feel good today. No, you decide how you're going to feel and you build the neurology to get there faster. And then finally, the thing I do in that program is sleep. So we talked about how much of our behavior is unconscious. A lot of the action actually happens when people are asleep. So I'll work with someone to help them not only get better quality of sleep, more efficient sleep, but to train their subconscious to solve their biggest problems while they're sleeping. So they awaken in the morning, energized, empowered, and with those solutions. Excellent. And this is kind of because I know that a lot of my listeners are coaches as well. And some, some kind of have, you know, where they give like a 15 minutes free call and stuff like that. Mm -hmm regarding the conversion rate for that then like what would you be looking to try to convert on the amount of free because obviously your time is worth money and you don't want to be spending your whole week doing free calls but like how do you look at that as you know whether it's half an hour or 15 minutes i'm not sure and i'm not sure, sure. If you can do that but i know that a lot of coaches they do that just to see if it's a right fit as well and i just yeah. curious like that you know you're having a good week good month good whatever that is like, okay, I'm converting one in five. I should have one in two, mm -hmm. one in 10. So it's not going to be a specific uh, number to me because I want, because I would rather have one 
very good client, then five kind of okay ones. So I do a complimentary 30 minute consultation. And some of the things that I'll do is help somebody to figure out what is their subconscious processing style. So do they, people tend to process things more direct literal or more through metaphors and inferences more indirectly. So I'll meet with somebody and help them figure that out. And that's, that's at no, at no charge. And if they don't resonate with the work or it's not the right time, then at least they still have a tool they can take with them. And then if they want to know more um, and they want to get started with coaching, they can do that too. So what, what's the, the best conversion rate? It really depends because um, on a given week, you know, I could have 15 consultations booked and they're not with the right people somebody who's not committed to change or they're too skeptical or they're not ready or they're, they don't have the finances for it. Um, I, th- I prefer to have people check me out a little bit and then usually the right people will set up the, the call and we tend to know very quickly if it's going to be a good, a good fit or not. And I think kind of foreground that as well is when you do get the right clients they're more likely to give you a referral when they've benefited from because especially a business owner they surround themselves usually with other business owners and if they've you know grown by 2x 10x whatever or just you know emotionally or whatever they can go hey john you should check out nick and it kind of it leads by you being selective and not just taking anybody it kind of it comes back you know totally and that's, that's one of the biggest things I've had to learn uh, in the past year or two is that not all money is good money. And the if you can only kind of help somebody, then maybe they have a better option. They should just do that instead. But to find those people that are the really good fits, the really good clients, um, the people who have a history of successfully investing in themselves, the people who understand the power of their mind, maybe they've already been hypnotized or, or done some kind of um, healing work. Those are the people that I want to spend the most, the, the right time on because I can help them the most. Yeah. Excellent. And just, I know I said finally, but uh, it just won't work because th- it's something that I've been doing in, say, the sure. last 10, 20 shows is the promotion of the person. Because I saw, um, I think it's an Instagram, you've got a sizable uh, following. And is it just that, or what do you use for kind of? kind of promoting yourself because it whether yeah. a person wants to be a coach or a speaker or whatever, I like to know what they find is the best strategy and how they've grown it. Sure. So the, the two ways that's probably, if someone wants to get in contact with me, whether they're interested in coaching or they, they want to become a coach themselves, or they want to learn about hypnosis, or they just want to say, hi, I'm happy to meet with, with anyone. Cause there's a lot of people, for example, who they don't end up buying anything that I, uh, that I have because it's, um, it's not the right time for them maybe, but then they get curious. And actually uh, several people I've talked to have become hypnotherapists themselves. So I'm, I will talk to anybody, whoever, uh, happy to, to do that. The, the two platforms that I've had the most success with have been my Instagram, and my website. So if you guys want to uh, get in touch, always happy to chat. My Instagram is at Nick Gnosis. That's N I C N O S I S. And then my website is apex mind coaching. That's a P E X mind coaching.com. No, and I make sure I put all the links in the podcast description. But I thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. A bit different than usual, but I think a lot you can gain a lot from, from this conversation. So thank you very much. Absolutely. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Thanks for having me, Roy. No problem. So that's all for the Speaking Podcast. You can find all our episodes on speakingpodcast.com. As mentioned, Brown Bitchute on YouTube, and you'll find the links in the podcast description. Be sure to give us a thumbs up, five star rating. It all helps. Share with your friends. Until next week, take care.